So, I've been playing Deofield Chronicles because you have no time to game. So I've changed up my format a little bit. So I'm going to do a review series called When the Credits Roll. Basically, the idea is I only do a review once I've seen the game credits roll. Basically, to add a bit of credibility to my reviews, as you know at this point, I've played the main bulk of the game and seen the story. <laughs> and I've not just had like a crack for a couple of hours and made an opinion based off that, which I don't do anyway. Most of the games I've reviewed I've completed, but I want to make it formal <laughs> that this is what I'm doing. So anyway, Deofield Chronicles follows the story of a mercenary band, the Blue Foxes, and their rise from humble beginnings to a world-class powerhouse of a force. The world of Deofield is an interesting one. The main continent has seen a long war for resources, one which the island of Deofield has mainly stayed out of until recently, that is, as the Empire and their opposition, the Alliance, from the main continent have set their beady little eyes on a resource called Jade an item of incredible power that is the main source of their magic's machines. Deerfield just so happens to be rich in this, as their ancient sorcery does not actually consume the jade like the magics of the continents do, but more of channels it, making it more like a renewable source compared to the Empire's usage. But in among this growing threat from the continents, the Blue Foxes must contend with political intrigue from within as well, from within as well as from without, and decide what is truly best for their home's future. The story is very politics focused and can be quite heavy in places with lots of plays going on from many different players. So you need to invest some mental energy in remembering who and what everything is. The characters of the Blue Foxes present an interesting group as we have Andreas, or Rias, who is our main protagonist. He's an interesting lead as he's not your classic goody two shoes. He's far more calculating and cool headed. And interestingly, he's not the big sword guy either. He's more of an assassin archetype. Then we have Fred, his childhood friend and the proper royalist do-gooder of the group. He's the guy with the big sword and rides a horse. Uh, but there's something more going on with him. Izzy, who acts as kind of like a balance between these two, trying to prove that she is a good mercenary, as her father was a legendary mercenary, who we may or may not see later on. Iscarion soon joins the group, another do-gooder, but one that sees himself as a knight errant as his previous lord's actions did not sit well with him. And as such, he's become a bit of an anti-royalist. So he's a bit different to most of the knights who are obviously in bed with their lords and kings. And th the person that kind of rounds out our little main group is Walter Quinn. And she's not one you expect when you first meet her, as she seems like a proper prim and princess noble type person. But she's kind of a psycho may be corrupted somewhat by the power she wields. All of these sit under Duke Hende and Lorraine. Duke Hende finances the whole operation and is kind of the de facto noble in charge. And is quite a mysterious fellow, with Lorraine being his main contact for the group. But there's a lot more going on with uh, the Duke than you might realise. Many others join throughout and fill up the roster. And we do get quite a bit of characterization for each character through the side quests and dialogues. The theming is varied, we have that fantasy world on the verge of industry, and it creates an interesting dynamic, and I find it strangely reminiscent to Final Fantasy VIII, especially if you watch their teaser trailer. It's a bit less techy though. Um, along with this, we have the Royals versus Democracy Dilemma, which is right, but interestingly, unlike most games, we actually sit on the side of the slightly tyrannical Royals and Lords. All this is wrapped up in the war for resources being fought, but with said resource being both a renewable and exhaustible resource depend on how you use your magics. It's somewhat relevant to today's issues. And there's also this undercurrent of uh, church corruption, uh, other bits and pieces like that. It does feel like the developers have somewhat been keeping abreast of current day issues and bringing them in in interesting ways. All this continues to an interesting conclusion. Just what is each character's motivation? Hmm. Before we dive into how combat works, let's have a look at what we do outside of battle first. Well, as with every tactics game recently, we get a home base to explore. We find all of our recruits and adjacent characters lingering around with some nonsense to say. And it's quite a nice little base, being funded by a noble and all. At the base, we can get our side quests. Outside of battle events, these boil down to go talk to a character with a little icon above their head. And it will net you a bit of extra story or character detail. And usually some gold and a bit of unit experience. 
You need experience being what levels up the Blue Fox's band as a whole, as opposed to individual character experience. And this affects several areas, such as your shop. Um, there's like a food, but that affects XP. And all these sort of things can be leveled up. Um, they provide ongoing benefits as you level up each individual element and the unit as a whole giving you like things like more gold or XP in battle and you can purchase better items from the shop etc. This leads us onto the shop and the items we can equip. It's all very simple. Weapons, of which we have multiple types for each class variant of our team. Accessories, which provide little bonus to things like HP and attack etc. Some having extra special effects. Items of which you can take three into battle and they are mostly healing related and you can later buy materials for weapon development such as well. Um, related to this weapon development, we have kind of like a science department. The easiest one to understand is the weapons development team. By spending weapon materials, we can unlock more weapons for the shop. The next is the skills development, which allows us to spend one of our resources to upgrade various skills that the characters have. Skills which are attached to weapons in this game. Um, these buffs are such things as reducing the skills EP cost, or making it hit a wider area, etc, uh, etc. Et and the last dev team is around summons. By using yet another material, and gold, we can buff our summons, of which we can take two into battle at any given time. This is similar to the skill development team, and it revolves around making your summons do more damage, hit bigger areas and such. This leads us to our characters. Each member can equip one weapon based upon their class, of which we have four. Now, there's probably official names, but this is how I consider them. Fighters, which can be split into dagger users, sword and board, and axes. The mounted crew, which are horsey and something special. Archers, which seem to have bows or crossbows. Mages, which are split into being a tackle healing focused. Each character can only really go down one path, though, as they are limited to the weapon they can use. So you can't really like customise characters in that regard, other than the weapon they've got. By equipping weapons to them, you do get a little bit of customization because each weapon comes with different skills. It's not like they have set skills themselves, it's literally all based around the weapon they've got equipped. Uh, you can then equip two accessories to each of your characters. And then in this equipment menu, there's actually an upgrade tree for each character as well. It's very much like all the previous ones by spending a resource you get from leveling up in this case. You can give them each character small buffs to things like attack speed, reduced EP usage, and all that sort of nonsense. But each character has their own one, as well as the unit as a whole having one, and as well as like the class types having. Yeah, it, it, there's a lot of little systems. None of them are very complicated though. This about covers everything that we do outside of battle. Basically, it boils down to talk to people for side quests and buff your characters, upgrade your equipment. It's it's all yeah, it's all simple. So now on to the meat and potatoes of any game, the actual gameplay. First, we select our battle from a cool little world map table thingy in the Blue Fox's war room. And then usually after a little bit of story tidbit, whether this be a cutscene or an in-engine kind of little conversation, we get to use the shops and such again. So if you don't want to do them walking around the base, you can do it here. But importantly, we can set up our formation. Our formation is four characters each of which can attach an ally. The attached allies offer a small little buff and whatever skills they have from the weapons they've got equipped, you can now use as that character. So it kind of expands your uh, skill repertoire usage. So say you've got a horse boy and you want to be able to heal, attach a mage. Or, you know, you're, you're assassin guy, but you haven't got a stun skill, attach an ar archer with stun shot. They also get um, some XP for aiding in the battle, you know. Then we get into the battle. And unlike many that have come before, this is actually not played on a grid. It's not turn-based, it's real-time with a pause mechanic. But what does this mean? Well, the game doesn't stop. Everything is happening at once. The enemy is moving while you do, and if you're not managing your team, you're going to get hit by the enemy. But as the game doesn't stop <laughs> basically like it does in in a turn-based game but anyway you can move your crew individually or as a whole which generally is how i moved them i moved them as a whole whole group because i was playing on switch 
On PC, I imagine it would be far easier to micromanage using the keyboard and mouse. It's a little bit difficult to micromanage on the Switch itself, as I didn't feel like I had the uh, cursor move it, the ability to move the cursor fast enough as you would with a mouse. But anyway, you can move them by either just select an area and they'll run to it, or pause it and kind of set waypoints. Pausing it is just holding down a button, which allows you to set the waypoints. And then you can engage the enemy if you select on them or interact with treasure chests, which is just on a, on a click as part of the movement. Once in battle, your characters will auto attack until you bring up the skills menu. This is where another pause option comes in, as bringing up the skills menu pauses the game for you to select which skill you want to use. And you then get to select the target or area, as not every skill targets an individual. Some of them allow you to target an area on the map. Um, so yeah, we have like single target abilities. We have a single target ability with like an effect around it, or we have like big circles or cone shaped abilities that can just be laid down anywhere. Each of these on usage cause a cooldown, um, which means that character can't use a skill until they've cooled down, each skill presenting a different cooldown time. All the while doing this, you, you and the enemy are auto attacking. The enemies can then use skills of their own, but when they do, it doesn't activate straight away. You see the like usage effect area, what it's gonna hit, and then the a bar, like it fills up with red. So it gives you time to counter it. In this case, you have to use a skill technique to counter it or kill them. But while they're in this state, they have a higher defense. So your skills will do less damage. So they're a bit harder to kill while they're using a skill. So it's to make sure you're not just murdering everyone in time. Um, some enemies do have a fun little extra with multiple health bars denoted by little dots, red dots next to their name. And every time you deplete a full health bar, they explode with a knockback, lose any of the state effects you've given them, and then they gain a new health bar. It's Overall, it's quite a simple system. Control your dudes around the map, try to position for the best effect for your skill usages, back attacks do extra damage, make sure you're stunning when the enemies are unleashing their skills, and all around try and kill them as quickly as possible. While this is happening as well, enemies will occasionally drop little orbs. These are either increase your TP gauge, which is what allows you to use summons, um, which is a separate bar that goes off as you kill enemies or collect these little TP crystals. Purple ones, which give you EP, which is the resource used to be able to use your skills, kind of like mana or something like that in other games, or green ones, which give you some back health back. Now, as a note for each battle, you can have up to three side quests, and they're always the same three. Um, complete it in X amount of time, find a chest, and don't let anyone die. Complete these will give you extra items and skill points, etc., to spend with your development team back in base. So yeah, what did I actually think was good about the game? Well, I actually quite got into the story after an initial slow start, though. Um, some of the characters, I truly enjoyed seeing how they react to everything going on around them, and just wondering what weirdness they were going to be getting up to next. Uh, the game was quick, with most battles lasting just a couple of minutes. Uh, I think that one of the longest ones was about six for me. Um, I mean, I could play it in small bursts in like while doing other things. And visually, I really enjoyed the look and feel of the game. The maps were presented in this kind of like diorama style. Like you could almost see it as like a model that you could build. And some of the artwork is quite nice as well. Um, on the negative side, though, the battles are simple and can feel repetitive. Andreas, our main dude, gets a skill practically at the start of the game, which carried me through about 90% of it. And it just out-damaged everything at the time. And he's, he's basically a murder machine that kills like a lot of things in one hit with that skill throughout most of the game. Um, it's not until near the end where other characters caught up by having their final skills, like their biggest skills on their most powerful weapon, could finally match Andreas's skill that he got at the start. Now, as well, I enjoyed the ending, but it's very much the feel of setting up for further content, just so you're aware. Before my final thoughts, let's have a quick look at the critical reception. So, I played it on Switch, so let's have a look at that. And on Metacritic, it scored a 67. 
with a 4.1 user score. Jeez, ouch, that's kind of brutal. Anyway, my final thoughts do not align with the critics. I'd give it a much higher rating than that. I thought overall it's, it's an enjoyable experience with an interesting cast and story. And the battle system is fun, if not getting much beyond serviceable. So anyway, if they were to make more content, I'd probably give it a go. And from what I've heard, they are doing an extra DLC content for free around Walter Quinn, around Walter Quinn and I'm intrigued to see what that is. So my final rating is give it a go.